So uh, we already did our, a little bit of our intro. So my name is Aaron Toth um, and this is Jorge. Uh, and and we're, we're from FinAI. So FinAI is a conversational AI chatbot platform uh, for banks and credit unions. We're located in Vancouver, BC, Canada, which is great that we're able to speak to you today. That's one of the benefits, I guess, of this, this whole, uh, everything that's going on in the world right now. But we do service banks and credit unions worldwide. Our chatbot is a is a banking chatbot. Uh, it, we we handle customer customer service acquisition as well as API API enabled banking flows such as get balance, viewing transactions, ordering checks. And our bot is uh, it, it has a vertical domain knowledge, meaning it, it it is very 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 smart on banking. Effectively, is what, what that means. And we uh, have supervised learning models uh, employing offline learning, which I think Jorge will speak a little bit more on. Yeah. So for our models, uh, or at least the main the main model that we have, uh, is a supervised learning model. For anyone who isn't familiar with the concept, it just means that we have a, a big set of data, labeled data um, that we put into the uh, we give it to the to the model, and then it trains on it, and that's how it learns. Uh, but it uses offline learning. That means as you're speaking to it, it's not learning. We are just getting that data. We manually label it, and we train a model, deploy it, and that's where that's where you would see an improvement of it. Um, for a little more technical. We use a BERT model, which is a bidirectional encoder representation from transformers, um, which basically just means that it, it's one of the state of the art type models. And uh, it basically learns uh, in a bidirectional way. So instead of learning just from, from left to right in, within the sentence, it learns from both sides. That just allows the model to learn more uh, kind of context within the, within the messages. Um, the, for the for the scope of this presentation, we're not really going into the more technical details, but just in case anybody's interested. Um, so for some basic concepts, in case someone might not be super familiar with this or is planning on implementing their own chatbot, doesn't have these concepts in mind. Mm. So an utterance, when we say an utterance, we're referring to a message from the user to the chatbot. Um, it can be an actual, the person actually typing, or it might be a, a button click or something uh, that in the, end, in the background is sending an utterance to the bot. Um, the intent is the general user intention without considering context. That means if the person says something along the lines of what are the fees for my credit card, um, that is the, the intent would be what are the fees or, you know, like fees information, um, but the, the credit card part just provides context that's not really accounted there. Um, the credit card there would be considered an entity, um, which is the part of the utterance that <laughs> context to it and is usually a, is the object of the utterance usually. Um, synonyms are different ways to refer to some entities. The reason I'm, I, that's, that's bolded there, the sum part, is because uh, we only use synonyms and what we call fuzzy matching for um, uh, things that have a, a finite ways to refer to them. So uh, maybe names of products and things like that. Well, things that have infinite ways to refer to them like dates or places, we use machine learning to, them <laughs> or to detect them. Um, and then lastly, responses is just one or multiple messages from the bot to the user. It might be in, in actual response to an utterance, or it might be like a welcome message or, a, or things like that. Um, yeah, so um, to get us started on, uh, I guess, going, going straight to the point, uh, starting with some of the things that we've learned um, as we have developed <laughs> the chatbot for Finn. Um, one of the things that come up is, is kind of problems within bot and human understanding. And uh, one of those main ones is the kind of extremes of the ways people interact with the bot. Um, one of those is people people talking to the bot through keywords. So people use um, utterances that don't really have much context or single, single word utterance and things like that, just like money or credit card, um, just kind of expecting the chatbot to give something um, or to respond something to that. Uh, but because the, the, there's no context to it, the credit card utterance alone could really mean anything. Uh, and then we have the other end of the spectrum there, which is a live story. It's the person really just typing and typing either uh, multiple intents. So the person saying, I want to apply for a credit card. And I also want to know what the fees are and what the interest rates are. All this kind of multi-intent paragraph, um, which the, the bot is just not really capable of responding to all of it. It'll usually just pick one thing and try to you know do its best to respond to it. Mm. Um, right. Or, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Right. I, I was going to say, right. And, and that example, you know, really carries into the, the conversational aspect. People consider that sort of a drawback of AI. However, if you think about it, if I went into a bank, if I went into a bank and was speaking to a teller and I just walked up and said, credit card, 
it's not really enough information, right? The, the human being also requires that context. And in the same, the same place, if I go in and I basically tell an entire paragraph about my day, uh, maybe I had a fight with somebody and I got into all this and all that, you know, I, I'm more than likely going to, to at least slow down that teller, right? Like it, 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 is, it is truly a part of just any, any conversational interaction as well. Um, yeah, in terms of how we handle it, uh, uh, Jorge will have a little bit more as well, but, but with both of them, we, we have to deal with it. So we have to basically mitigate the situation. We have a, a system that we, we use called fallback, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail uh, later on. And then in terms of that sort of keyword idea where we're missing that context, uh, where we just have the, the signal word utterances or, or someone speaking effectively in what we would consider entities, we do use something called, uh, work with something called context or memory of the conversation to help us along that way. And uh, for that, the one where the person is using, giving us way too much information, many, many different in, intents in the, in the conversation, we, we deal with that in a way around sort of um, a long utterance handling where if uh, the bot recognizes that someone's asking uh, something that is a much too long, many paragraph, multi-paragraph response, we can handle that by um, uh, effectively prompting them to, to, uh, to maybe shorten that up a little bit and helping them get to, to a human who might be able to help them uh, more completely in that moment. Yep, I think the only thing I would add to that is that, yeah, like the, the customizable long utterance handling uh, depends on the customer. We allow them to, to just pick how, how long is too long within an utterance. We usually, the default is about 150 characters. Some customers we have it for 200. Some customers don't really want to have that enabled, um, which is fine. And depending, and, and it's also customizable in the way that uh, the customer can choose how they want to respond to it. One of our customers, uh, if they see a long utterance, they want to just send the, the person straight to human support. Another might just give kind of an error and just kind of say, you know, hey, I'm not really good with long trans. Can you shorten your trans and just give an example? Um, and then for the cases of what Aaron mentioned about context and memory of the conversation, that is kind of a, a deeper feature that we do want to get into because it's it's fairly interesting. So you have two scenarios that uh, kind of to the average user kind of looks very similar, uh, but in the background is slightly different. So the first scenario is clarifying a product or service. Um, so in this case, what we're doing is the person is saying, as you can see in this example, what are the fees like? So this is just, just going to give them a generic response for fees of you know, any product that they want. And you know, we ask them which product they want. And if they say credit cards, be it they type it or they, they click a button for it, um, they will get their response for what are the fees for a credit card. Um, we, that, that basically means like in the background, we're keeping track of what happens in the previous step uh, of the conversation and then making use of that. In this step, the entity takes precedent over the intent. Um, we explained before as you know that if you just set credit card alone with no context, the bot might respond with something, you know, maybe it's gonna assume that you're applying or something. Same way if you went to a teller and you say credit card, a, a teller might assume you want to apply, another teller might ask you, what do you want? Um, so a loan credit card doesn't necessarily have a, a consistent behavior, but when you um, you know, is a follow-up to something else, in that case, then it does, then you know that you're gonna get, you know, that's gonna, the entity is gonna take precedent and it's gonna take into consideration that context. Um, sorry, there, oh, did I just? I think the wrong there way, yeah. <laughs> there we go, perfect. Yeah, so similarly, uh, in the way that that last example really allows us to make that a more conversational experience, really one more like you'd have with another human being, and the same happens with this idea of switching topics. So, so it's, it's a very similar sort of flow, effectively the opposite though. So in the first example, a user asks a question that does have a, both uh, the context and the, the topic. So it has, I want to apply for a travel rewards visa. They've specified a, an entity as well as an intent here, and they get an answer. And then actually, you know, like we're, they're continuing to have this conversation about this card. They need to know a little bit more. And they follow up with a question that goes, actually, I need to know about the fees. They haven't, again, specified that topic, but it's really important here that, that, that AI does give them this great experience where it remembers, okay, right, we're talking about this specific uh, card. I can refer, refer you here to give you the, the answer to that fees response for this card, and we can continue that conversation. Um, it really allows for that, that conversational back and forth. And it also helps to, um, to educate the user in how to use the bot, which is something that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later as well.
Yeah, and to add to that in general, as far as like keeping track of the conversation as it goes from the context perspective, um, we normally keep track of just a single turn before. So, you know, if you're in, you send this a trans, then it remembers what you said in the previous one, uh, except in cases where it's longer kind of long form operations, things like uh, transferring money where you need to say, you know, source account, destination account, the memo, uh, different things. So in that case, obviously it does remember the whole, um, the whole flow of the conversation for that. But for things like this, just kind of FAQs, um, we do just remember the previous turn um so yeah so i guess this uh these features um they they are very powerful but they also have you know their pros and cons of course um because like i said they the, in that case the entity takes precedent over the intent mm. Um, it, it definitely allows for, you know, uh, to complete the utterances, for example, or, or uh, have a better uh, or an improved conversation flow. But um, one of the cons is that it entirely depends on entity detection. So we have a problem with entity detection or the person is referring to an entity in a way that we didn't foresee. Um, then in that case, maybe, you know, the, the thing won't really respond the way it, we would want it to or the way the user might want to. And then on the other hand, also, you have an example like this one where you say, I want to apply and then you say interest rates for credit card, then that will trigger apply for credit card response. Um, this is, uh, as you can see in here, it's not really taking into account that this is the interest rates intent. It's taking into account, it's taking precedent, the, the entity itself. Um, this is, of course, not super ideal, but uh, we would say that in the vast majority of cases, this is not really the case, like the person is actually completing the utterance. Um, but if that were to happen, if you actually wanted the interest rates here, um, this usually, we always have ways to kind of lead the user to the right place. So this would probably have a button or something like, oh, if you want to know the interest rates for the credit card and go here, um, from something along those lines. Right. We we never want to strand the user there. And that really gives an idea of sort of that push and pull uh, of, of effectively the best possible experience while still honoring the fact that the AI needs to work in a, in a great way. So there's, there's really a, the, that push and pull there. In terms of switching topics, it's really quite the same, right? So the cons are the same. It depends on the, the AI actually recognizing what the user is saying in terms of that entity detection. Um, but it, and again, the pros are really similar as well. It really just improves that conversation flow and allows the user to continue that conversation and get more information and ask follow up questions. Yeah, um, and for this example, um, again, you have you know apply for a credit card. This would give you the response for applying for a credit card. And then if you say, I want to know your interest rate, you might actually just want to know the generic response for interest rates rather than the interest rates for credit card. But again, it, the, the, the previous entity that you mentioned takes precedent. Again, never leaving the user stranded is what kind of helps us get out of this. So we say this, and then we, we always have a way to kind of lead the user back to where they actually want uh, or have different options to move the user around. Um, Another thing that people might not consider um, when, again, if you want to make your own chatbot or something, is country-specific expressions or, or, or region-specific expressions. So to give you two examples um, that, that are more kind of things that we would see in a chatbot. Um, oops, sorry. Um, there. Um, so in Colombia, when someone is really mad, they use the word berraco, while in Venezuela, they would use the word arrecho. This is a, a very um, like, kind of like a very angry way to refer to it, which you might you, mean, you might be surprised how, um, how uh, I guess, aggressive people can be with our bot. Um, but that means if, if our bot was, you know, talking, it, our bot was trained with, say, Colombian data, and then we wanted to talk to someone from Venezuela, then there are words there that might not match. Uh, in the case of UK people, um, apparently they, they might not use checking account to use current account. So it's something that you want to take into consideration with when, with your labeling process, uh, as well as with the amount of data that you have. Um, your entity detection needs to account for this. In our case, if we're using um, maybe synonyms and fuzzy matching to detect this type of thing, then we would need a synonym of checking account that's current account for specific to the UK, um, just so that, that we're actually able to do that. In the first scenario, um, maybe we need some more data that actually has these words, because Keep in mind that these supervised learning models are just learning from patterns, right? So in some cases, maybe it doesn't make much of a difference if you miss out uh, on a certain word in your data, maybe the rest of the, of the thing, uh, of the pattern, the bot's able to understand. But in some cases, you might, it might be important, especially, you know, depending on, your, on the type of bot that you have and your domain, um, some words might be very different in another uh, region or country or language, in which case you do want to have that data um in your in your vault for training um, and yeah and that yeah. that really that really does highlight sort of this idea that that it's that we sort of bring up as well at the end uh, 
you know, it may not work perfectly that from that very first moment, the training is, is constant, right? So, so these are the sort of things where you see these examples, like, especially that UK one checking account, current account, same with the one about the, the, the word for anger or the, the way that is, that's one of those things that can be a fast follower. Um, it, it, you're, it, it's just part of that, that process with the, with such a new technology here. Yeah, and when we when we have when we're first deploying a bot to a new region or a new country or something, um, you might have trouble with this kind of situations. Um, in some cases, it may makes make sense for you to do some seeding data, some synthetic data that you yourself craft. Um, but in other cases, I mean, what we do is we usually ask the customer to provide us with some some sort of call log or chat log, any conversation related to banking that we might be able to use as a transfer the labeling process and then to train our bot uh, or our model into. Um, to actually get a head start in that region. Because if not, then, well, I mean, we, we might just train in, say, English uh, for the UK, um, but we might have a slight, you know, nuances and, and little things that might not work perfectly at first, but it, it'll always get better in time. Uh, Aaron, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um... So the next part, we're going to jump into that idea of that user experience, which is really fully in concert with all of it. So we've been talking about how we work to train the AI itself. Um, but, you know, part of that is that we do need to actually be working to educate users on how to how to use this, the chatbot as well. So conversational AI is truly bleeding edge technology. People are still learning how to interact with chatbots. And if they have interacted with chatbots in the past, it's really possible that they've had really terrible experiences interacting with chatbots in the past. So we're, we're coming up against people who may be a little bit uh, reticent to do that already. And if they do interact with it, they might not understand what that, 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 uh, that best way is because we, um, we, we all have learned over the past, what, 10, 20 years, how to use Google, for example, right? So, and it's a very different experience. Um, rule number one, to my mind, of conversational design for a chatbot is you have to make sure that the user knows that it's not human. So, I, you know, I think maybe we've all had this experience. I had one last week where I got an unsolicited message on LinkedIn that looked like it was from a person. It had a person's name and a face, and it was very quickly apparent that it was actually just a hard-coded chatbot. That's a really unsettling experience. It's not. It's not a good one. It also doesn't set me up to understand like how to interact with this this item. So so we need to make that clear that it is not a human. Can't have a fully human conversation with it. But the problem with doing that is sometimes that's a little bit at odds with this goal that we have of getting the users to to dis, or to interact with the chatbot in a conversational manner, um, because the conversational manner is what it's trained on, and that's actually how they're going to get that best experience out of it. So we, we do have to deal with that mostly by, um, by failing gracefully. It's, it, we are going to fail. We're still brand new. We're still learning. We're going to still stumble along the way. But we need to fail in a manner that continues to educate that user and actually still lets them get to the end of their, their problem resolution successfully without being too frustrating. Yeah, and also as as you're managing the user's expectations, again, make sure they understand that that it's not a human, um, but also manage the expectations regarding the way they should speak to the bot. So if your bot, I mean, if you're having a more of a keyword bot, that's fine. Just let the user know that that's the case. In our case, we're kind of in between looking for a hopefully a little bit more human interaction to an extent. Um, so in that case, we need to let the user know, because if you don't manage those expectations, if you're building your own chatbot, then the person is gonna get mad at the bot, like the person's gonna get frustrated um, if they are assuming that they can talk to the bot in a specific way, when in reality, that's not really what you can actually handle. Um, so managing those expectations, you know, keep the, keep the user or the customer happy. And yeah, I think that's how you actually help with the proper, get, get the proper experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we get an opportunity to do this right from the very get go. So something that we really focus on with with our chatbots, and that we encourage people to do is really right from the beginning with that welcome message. That's where we initially interact with that human. And that's, you know, our first step forward. Um, so the very first thing that we have to do, we have to establish it's a bot. So they do understand that they're not speaking to a human. And as well, we give we have an opportunity here to do a little bit of that education, right? So, so we're still showing them exactly how they can interact with the bot. And here, like the main takeaway for me is that what's really critical here is the examples that we're giving are actually going to work. So, so we do, you know, find in some cases that with these welcome messages, uh, and I've come across them in the wild, people will include uh, education there or little tips and what can do that don't actually work. So, so in the case of our, our welcome messages, uh, to my mind, it's critical that that all of these things work. So a user could actually copy and paste any of those those utterances or those those suggestions uh, in our welcome message 
paste them right into the bot and it will get them to their goal. So they are like, they're giving a little bit of a, of a help uh, to, to get them to that next spot and, and educating them in the process. Um, the other thing that we find really helps as well to especially encourage them to, to interact in that conversational manner is giving the bot a personality. Yeah, it's, it's AI, it is a bot. But, but giving it a little bit of that personality, having it have maybe a little bit of, of, of humor to it or just not to be super formal, having it always speak in the first person also encourages users to interact in that conversational manner, which will give them the best experience going forward. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, um, regarding the, the educating the user, again, keep in mind that depending on who your audience is, uh, some people may be more familiar with this technology or less familiar with it. Um, again, you'd be surprised how many people uh, we have that despite us mentioned in the world of virtual assistant, et cetera, um, they still either speak to the bot or just assume that it's a human. Um, so again, educating the user, manage those expectations. Um, and just you know, kind of tutorialize or, or explain properly the experience based on your audience. If your audience is people who are very familiar with this, maybe you don't need it so much. But in the case of banking, everybody uses banking. <laughs> yeah. So so when we talked about the idea of that failing gracefully, again, having a trip and a fall not a big deal. It's going to happen. We're still learning. We're still figuring this all out. But we need to figure out a way to mitigate it for that user not turn them off the experience and actually allow them to get to that result. So an example here, and this is what we talked about before with uh, when we mentioned fallback. So this is the example of what we call fallback. So with fallback, we allow the user to fail once. So in this case, this user has said, my dog ate my credit card. And the bot isn't really sure uh, what that means exactly. It's never seen this utterance before. It obviously recognizes parts of it, but it isn't sure exactly what to do. So we give them an option and we sort of, um, we allow them to say, hey, did you want to rephrase it a little bit? I'm not sure what's happening here, but also I have some ideas of what you're talking about. And if you look at the options, they're actually pretty good. Like it's pretty good on that. And I think Jorge can sort of explain a little bit of how that works. Yeah, so in this part, basically what's happening kind of more in the background is we're getting this utterance, it's getting sent to the model. Um, the model is not super sure what intent this belongs into, but it has a list of intents that it thinks it might belong to. We have kind of a threshold of, you know, this is how sure the bot has to be or the model has to be in order to actually say, hey, this is this is for sure what they want. Uh, and in this case, it's not really hitting that. Um, so we're picking the top two intents that the model thinks um, the user might be referring to. And we're also giving them the option to rephrase. So if at this point you said anything that actually made sense to the bot or something entirely different, if you decided to change the topic, if you just decided to say, you know, I lost my credit card, then it, it would make sense if you type it or if you click it, it would have the same effect. Um, or if you decided to go, you know, what are the fees for my savings account or something, then that also, it would also respond properly to that. Um, yeah, and then yeah. I guess... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Aaron. Yeah, and then and then and then if they really do double down, which we do find sometimes, and that especially would happen with someone that that really ultimately wants to talk to a human, maybe in that case, or has a more complicated issue. So if they do double down, in this case, the person doubled down with effectively repeating their question again. Um, it, it, at that point, we need to give them an out, right? We need to give them a way to get their problem resolved, mitigate the fact that we failed. So in this case, what we normally do, is we do suggest that, you know, I think it's probably best that we connect you to a human being, somebody that's gonna be able to actually help you with this situation so that we don't get too frustrated and we can actually find a resolution to your problem here. Really important to have that balance between, we're trying to give you the best customer service, but we're also trying to, to use this new technology and, and educate you on how to use that technology going forward. Because it will give a better experience in the long run, but but for some people and some problems, it's just not the right right solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then yeah. So in conclusion, just to summarize the two main types of challenges that you're going to face again when building your own chatbot. The first one is challenges when training the bot. Um, you have to always prepare for the different ways humans are going to use language. This includes again uh, different uh, ways of of talking to the bot with you know keywords, uh, long form utterances, all kinds of things, as well as different um, regions and different ways to use the actual words in the language. Mm part of that is fixed with data, data, and more data. So um, if you do, if you are allowed, if you have a customer and you can ask them for data, any data works. So you can take call logs and then just make those into utterances and label them, um, if that's kind of what your bot does. Um, and if not, you can craft your own utterance, what you think the user might say, and then obviously, you know, set the expectation straight that these are synthetic utterances. And then as you go, the bot will get better. Because again, we're recording all those utterances and then 
uh, annotating them or labeling them and then retraining. And you know, with time, it's, it's always going to get better. Um, and again, conversation context, depending on what type of bot you're going for, uh, might make sense. Again, if you have a keyword bot, that's totally fine. Um, you might not need as much context there, um, but it can help make the conversation a bit better. And obviously keeping into account those, those pros and cons of what are you giving up in favor of retaining this context if you're giving up anything. Um, and yeah, yeah then the, Aaron kind of speaks to the challenges of educating the users. Yeah, and I, and I think that the second part, to our mind, these these are both equally as important. So so as much as we do have to train that bot, we also need to work on educating the users, and that's that's the, the really important right now, especially. So so again, just to reiterate, we need to make sure that they know that they're dealing with a bot. We have to guide them in how to interact at many opportunities. So anytime that there's maybe a small trip and a fail and you have to expect that that failures are, are going to happen, we can give them a little bit more instruction on how to, to, to do better and learn to, to interact with it the next time around. And we have to manage the expectations. So like the from launch day one, the bot's gonna perform very well. Your bot that you make yourself is gonna perform very well, but you know what? It's just gonna keep getting better from there with more data and more learning for both the user as well as the bot. It's just going to go go up from there and that's that's the goal yeah and i guess yeah i mean in general i think we sometimes have different expectations of what a bot might do versus what a human might do and that's fine in in one way but Again, consider that you know we'll, we'll have people come to us uh, or, or even to the bot or anything and say you know why is the bot not responding to where money or something along those lines when in reality well I mean think about it if if someone said to you if you were a bank teller and they said where money then you might be pretty confused as well maybe some person might assume that they want to maybe know their balance or something or someone else might assume that they lost their money or something they want to know where it is um, anything like that so um, we always kind of try to ask that question is you know what would a teller do yes the bot is not actually going to be as powerful as a human as a teller um but we're trying kind of trying to get there trying to get to a sweet spot where it's not uh, too simple it's also not you know too human because then that also hits the kind of uncanny valley part of things um so yeah i think that that part of managing expectations and also questioning yourself of you know what would a teller actually do in this scenario um actually helps a lot or whatever it is your domain if the teller doesn't make sense there um, yeah, so I guess this is the, the, the last part of it. Um, I think this just gives us some more time for answering questions and here are emails as well in case you want to contact us or we're also on LinkedIn as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I have definitely run into that expectation mismatch. Same example. There's a little chat window with uh, some smiling person's face and uh, the, the bot can uh, handle absolutely very little. Um, so re really appreciate uh, you bringing that up. I, I think people that make bots that kind of misrepresent or don't have a good experience ultimately give people a sour opinion of uh, chatbots in general. And it makes it harder for those cases where, where someone does have a, a very useful bot to kind of short circuit waiting on hold or waiting for a person for what's a fairly common operation. So that, that, was, that was really good to have. We do have a few questions. Um, what, one thing I was wondering about is when you were talking about context and keeping track of even multiple contexts or the order, how, how is that implemented? Is it more of a rules-based approach where you, you kind of have entities and your, your dialogue just kind of procedurally looks if credit card is not empty uh, or if, uh, if, yeah, if like a target equals credit card, do this and that, or is it part of like a neural network where that has a context, how does, how does that work? Um, so I guess it depends on the case for the kind of FAQ, you know, clarifying question type thing where you say, again, uh, what are the fees? And then you clarify with credit card. Um, for the power, it's more of a, again, the entity takes precedent. It's not so much rule-based necessarily. Um, it's not like a bunch of if statements, um, but basically we're just keeping track of the previous turn um, of the conversation, you know, what the intent we predict the way enti what entities we predicted. And we check, you know, are we able to use the entity from this current utterance in the previous, from the you know in the previous intent, and then if we do, because, because the bot knows if it has a response for it or not. If it does, then it'll respond with it. If not, it'll respond to something else. We have a machine learning model that um, we have different machine learning models, but uh, one that helps us predict. Uh, 
intent and the entities that have infinite ways to refer to them, so um, dates and, and locations and such. And we have a dialog model, which is the one that kind of lets us you know, deal with the flow of the conversation. So basically, we send those intent and entity plus the context of the conversation into the dialog model, and the dialog model predicts, you know, in this case, should we say, again, apply for a credit card, or should we say another response that made sense in this case? Uh, that's also a supervised learning model. Great, thank you. Uh, so sp speaking of the, the learning side of it, we have a question from Tim. Uh, how do you ensure your bot doesn't regress as it's trained with new intents? Like uh, things that you feel answered before, all of a sudden it's it's uh, now no longer doing properly. Mm, so we we have both kind of internal model reports. So every time we train a model, of course, we get a bunch of uh, model training and model validation metrics. Um, so we always have kind of a uh, it's not necessarily a hard threshold, but we do look at the metrics of how how much better, how much worse it got. Um, and we also have analytics of kind of real time things. So as, as things are, you know, people are talking to the bot, then we have a bunch of metrics related to how many queries were we able to actually respond properly, how many, you know, we failed, how many triggered fallback, et cetera. Um, for the case of training, because that's what you're going to get, right? Like as soon as you train it uh, with, say, a new intent, um, in that case, then it's kind of more of the internal metrics. Um, in some cases, it will get a slightly worse um, with, say, like your F1 score and such uh, model metrics. I think one thing that's very important is that <clears throat> um, internal metrics or model metrics don't necessarily equate to real metrics. If you have a new intent, um, if anything, I would say normally if we have a new intent and we have, say, a bunch of data that ended up being made kind of synthetic, um, plus a bit that we got from users, um, usually it ends up that that intent and the model ends up performing even better uh, just because that intent is, is kind of more maybe self-contained and it, 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 it works well. Um, but if it didn't, sometimes the, the, the performance might regress just a little bit. Um, in which case, again, if it doesn't regress too much, then it's fine. You got to remember that this kind of always gets better with time. Uh, but you do need quality annotation for that. It's not always just more data. If you annotate wrong, then you're not going to get good performance. But assuming that you have good annotations and annotators, then you shouldn't really have much of a problem, provided you have enough data. Yeah, makes sense. So we, we have we also follow questions. So how do you? measure user frustration I and mean, I, I think we've all seen kind of simple sentiment analysis on a on a per message level do you do something like that or do you have anything kind of that captures more of a history and context to determine if someone's frustrated and maybe like fast track them to to that human ask that you had um so i would say we we do have a bunch of analytics metrics not so much necessarily frustration that seems like a, it's, a, it's a bit of a subjective context content concept sorry uh, and Aaron may be able to add a bit more to this but as far as analytics goes we do um, keep we, we check um, basically out of what we call a user goal which is you know did the user manage to do what they wanted is basically what a user goal means um, were we able to actually respond to the query did we trigger fallback or did we trigger say a human support request which uh, normally a human support request means the person wasn't necessarily happy or didn't get what they wanted from the bot so um, they'll they'll go to a human um, all of that is tracked do remember that kind of keeping track of these things in real life uh, you're, you're not necessarily gonna be able to accurately say, um, hey, we responded to all of this, uh, say 90% accurately, because you would have to annotate all that data. You know, you would have to look at what the person said, what the bot said, based on what the person said, did the bot respond with exactly with what they wanted, which in some cases might even be subjective. Um, so instead of that, we look more of the, again, did we trigger fallback? We know that's kind of more of a failure usually. Uh, did we trigger human support? Same thing. Um, but Aaron, maybe, I don't know if you have something. Yeah. Oh, I, I was going to say, and, and during the actual live conversation in terms of how we can actually um, effectively help the user through those more frustrating moments, we do uh, we do annotate uh, negative experiences, right? So so we do have responses such as, okay, you know, uh, we recognize sometimes that users will use it language like like in Jorge's example from the languages, but but of anger or frustration with the bot or or why can't you do this or you you suck you know that, that sort of language and we can we can do a follow-up immediately in conversation right so that's one of those those opportunities that we have that if we're if our model is recognizing that sort of language and that sort of interaction that we can give them that option to to um either give them a little bit of that education or help funnel them off to a human being that's going to be able to deal with them uh and and hopefully not frustrate them in that in that manner going forward 
Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and to, add to that, so I guess we, we also have two intents. One that kind of depends more on the user, which is the feedback intent, which basically allows the user to leave feedback. So give a score to the bot and also leave a comment about it. So we, we do keep track of that. And also we have an, an intent that's, we call it bad job fin, which is basically just the person complaining. You know, if you say you suck, that's that's bad job fin. Obviously the bot will um, will apologize, give some guidance, et cetera. But it, you know, as far as analytics goes, and we also have, we also keep track of how many times that got triggered. You know, that people actually get mad at the bottom frustrated. That's another way that we also look at it. Great, yeah, that, that was really good to hear kind of the, the two phases of that. What can you do live to identify it? And then what can you do kind of afterwards to check how, uh, how people are doing uh, in aggregate and if you need to make clarifying flows or, or add things. So thank you. One more question. Uh, so how do, you, how do you manage the collaborative process of copywriting? Um, what do you do internally? What do you get from the client as far as input? And yeah. it's uh, some orgs prefer to have their conversation designed to write all the copy with the little client input. Others prefer to have the client drive it. And how do you kind of work with that to uh, to stakeholders, so to say? Yeah, so it's it's um, it's a really really good question. So so we do have that back and forth. Uh, the uh, it, it's 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 the fun experience, right? So, so effectively what we do is we have, have put together extensive templated ideals of our content. So for all of our, our user goals, we do have templated content that, that we work with our clients on. It's obviously not gonna be perfect and it's not one size fits all, uh, but they all are responses that we've found through our experience and through, through uh, with a number of customers and through uh, learning through all of our analytics and such, do a pretty good job. So um, we we start all of all of our our clients off with that with access to that with to those templated content uh, that the and suggest to them that they effectively keep keep to that uh, and use them as guidelines. Now part of the struggle that we have, you know, we we are working with financial institutions. Um, uh, they have. Um, a lot of, of legal and compliance requirements for their content. So there is definitely a back and forth. That templated content's not gonna work right out of the box, uh, the right out of the box. Um, so we do work with teams that often will have a copywriter on the, their own team, on the customer team. And, and we also have to work with sort of the, that product side of things that the people who are the, the subject matter experts for the financial institution is, are, uh, itself. Um, our best experiences are when, when we're working with a team that kind of has both on it. So, so a copywriter on the client side uh, on its own isn't sort of enough because they, they need to have someone with that who really knows the financial institution themselves. Um, but then they also need someone who maybe is working to keep them to that voice to their own like financial institutions uh, chosen voice and, and keep them aligned there. There is a back and forth. I don't think it's avoidable. Um, but what we try to do from our side is set them up as, as well as possible from the get-go with, with really good templated content that they can, they can just adjust where needed. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I think that kind of touched on something else I was thinking about, given that you work with multiple clients, like what, what do you do to have some sort of structure? And that sounds like you have a template approach to, to work with them. So you, you have your, your general flows for the bot and then kind of give them guidance on, on what they need to, to customize or, or just leave as is. Yeah, so we, and we, our bot is, is it's really smart. Sorry, I don't mean to toot our own horn there, but, but it, it has a lot of user goals. So we, we have, um, we have uh, trained it with, with upwards uh, close to 400 or 500 user goals. So it, it does know a lot about the banking domain. Um, and, but we, we do organize that in terms of how the client can deal with it. We, we deal with something in terms uh, we, we do with call drivers or chat drivers. So it's something that the bank's already familiar with or the financial institution's already familiar with uh, in terms of exactly what their, their, their clients are already asking. Um, and it makes it really easy to just go through and effectively uh, adjust that content where necessary based on exactly those topics. Great, thank you. We got one more question from uh, Shelby. Really good questions, Tim and Shelby. So, what what are the most valuable metrics you use to understand how effectively and accurately your bots performing and how to improve? Like things like fallback reports, false positive reports. Like, what what, what else do you look at? Um, I can give you. Yeah, I, I guess it's going to be a little bit subjective. There, what what we you know what people might find more useful in certain things. Um, I would say that uh, looking at you know things that are uh, have not been properly responded to again anything that triggers fallback badge of and human support that kind of stuff um, 
looking at those, we do have um, people looking at those and just kind of suggesting, say, you know, maybe maybe the indication that a lot of people are asking about a certain type of thing. It's also come up in, in annotations. Uh, when, when people label, they'll be able to see uh, not only the utterance, but what the model tried to predict it as. Um, in that case, uh, again, we will get suggestions uh, from the annotators of, hey, look, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of people asking about, I don't know, uh, investments or something. And maybe if you don't have an intent for investments, maybe it's worth creating one of them. Um, so that is very useful, of course, to, to actually have data to prove that, you know, you need a certain new feature or a new response for your bot. Um, uh, I guess another thing, again, got to remember always that the metric, there's metrics for the bot, the, for the model itself. Um, so your F1 score, accuracy, whatever you want to use. And then there is the actual in the wild sort of metrics of, you know, did we actually respond to this properly? Um, so I would say, I would argue that it's probably more useful to know what you couldn't respond to properly. Um, and then just from there, just make a decision of, hey, let's create this new intent, this new response, because people are asking a lot about this, um, as well as looking at your feedback as well. Um, although that's a bit more manual. Um, I don't know if Erin, do you have anything else to add there? No, I think I think that's really it. So yeah, we do we do do we do analyze the, the conversations as well, and we're looking for that problem resolution and, and places that that we are able to to improve that 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 situation. Um, it, it's a constant process, and we're you know I guess as we said, even the, the bots learning, the users learning, and we're learning as well, um, and always looking for for opportunities to to improve that experience for our users. Thank you. Uh, so one question was raised, what's the difference between user goals and intents? Is, uh, is kind of a goal an overarching thing that has multiple intents or, or how do they relate? Um, so usually intent is more kind of generic. Intent, again, intent doesn't account for context at all. Then a user goal is more uh, like from the user perspective, like what does the user want to accomplish? So the user, there's there might be a user goal for. The user wants to know the interest rates of a generic object or the user wants to know the interest rates of a credit card the interest wants sorry the, the user wants to know the interest rates of blah uh th there's multiple user goals for that well there's only one intent does that maybe make sense i think that answers the question <laughs> got it okay uh so we got two more questions and then uh then we have to wrap up so what what does your fallback policy look like do you have multiple fallbacks depending on like a threshold or, or how, how do you determine uh what to respond with um, so it's a two-state fallback policy, like we showed, um, and then there is, but well, I guess there's technically two. Um, one of them is, is more related to what, uh, how sure the intent model was of its prediction. Um, in that case, if it's not too sure, then you you see what what happens. And sorry, let me go back here. Can I? What's, okay, there. <laughs> uh, then you see this, uh, and it'll give you the options. And we have the fallback policy of our actual dialogue model not knowing what is going on with what you're sending it. So if we send it, say, like a combination of intent and entity that it's not really sure what to do with, then that's a separate fallback that just usually results in kind of, hey, you know, we don't really have a response for that, uh, which is that's the, the least ideal scenario. We normally don't really send something to the DAO model um, just randomly like that. We like make sure that it's actually something it can use. Um, so I guess, yeah, I would say there's technically two fallback policies there. Okay, and just to, to, to wrap up, what uh, if you can share what what tech stack or what what tools have you used for for your bots like uh, and and what kind of led you led you to those? Yeah, so I'm not sure how how deep I can go in that, but I can tell you that we use for for at least uh, the the NLP side of things. Um, we program with um, with Python. We use uh, PyTorch models. We use uh, like I said, uh, BERT for our transformer based models. And we use pre-trained models for each language. Um, so we'll have a, like a pre-trained model for uh, English, Spanish, et cetera. And then we will fine tune it with our own data. And uh, I guess for the dialogue side of things, we we kind of customize, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know, you call it product, but um, uh, Rasa, which is basically a library uh, for dialogue model, uh, basically, yeah, to like help you build chatbots. I don't know if it's particularly interesting for that, but the and then the the interactive or the interface of our our bot is is um, Node and React. Great, thank you. Really appreciate it. Had a had a great time uh, myself learning some of some of the things you're working on, and really great info for our audience. So, thank you both very much, and. Uh, Hopefully we can share the slides after the event and, and the video. You can you can let me know about that when you're ready.
and uh, we're planning our next Bots and AI event. So, so kind of stay tuned for what's coming up uh, next month as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much for having us.